Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this week's Construction Cast. Um, this week, we are looking at corporate social responsibility, um, and we're looking at it from three different angles to kind of get the different perspectives because it's something that we know means different things to different people. So, I'm joined this week by three great speakers um, I'll introduce to you now. So first up, we've got Bob Nightingale, who is Head of Fundraising at the London Legal Support Trust. Bob is one of the founders of the Trust and has over 35 years experience running free legal advice centres and engaging volunteers from the legal profession. Many of you may be familiar with the uh, London Legal Support Trust's annual legal walk, which um, in normal years sees up to 15,000 legal professionals taken to the streets of London to, uh, to walk 10k and raise money for charity. So you might have come across that over the years. Um, next up we have Sarah Williams who is a specialist construction barrister, barrister at Keith and Chambers. She is recommended in the directories as a quality junior and her cross-examination has been precise and incisive that she's completely on top of detail and the written work she does as excellent. But this week Sarah's joining us because she's also a member of Keaton's band who take part in the fundraising uh, Battle of the Bands competition Law Rocks which takes place all around the world. Um, and finally we have Will Richardson who is the founder and managing director of Green Element, which he established in 2004 with a desire to help as many businesses as possible go green. Green Element is an environmental management consultancy with 20 years experience based in London and Edinburgh and offers a range of environmental services to organisations from small SMEs all the way up to large corporations. So I'm going to start off with this morning with um, kind of the opening question of what is your definition of corporate responsibility because it means quite different things to different people so perhaps uh will if i come to you first yeah sure uh, what's the definition of corporate responsibility purpose does your organization have purpose i think you and that purpose can be driven and should be driven from all angles how are you with your colleagues what impact you have on your clients from a um, purpose point of view and the quality of work that you do. It, it incorporates absolutely everything about an organization. I mean, Green Element's a B Corp. Um, I don't know if um, people on this webinar understand what, or know what B Corp is. Um, people like Patagonia, The Guardian, Finister, um, Ben & Jerry's, um, innocent smoothies there's there's a group of us that are b corps and we're all purpose-driven businesses so i think it's incorporating everything it's making sure that your organization has a positive impact on the world okay fantastic and what about you sarah well i think um uh, the organization i'm in is perhaps a slightly different model in that it's a a bunch of 50 or 60 self-employed individuals who are neurotically working away uh, held together by a long-suffering and fabulous staff. So um, the, the idea of something being corporate is perhaps slightly different, and it's very much, I, I think, individual-led, individual, -led, individual uh, passion and pursuit. And, and as Will just mentioned, the, the purpose of it is often individually-led. But to that extent, it is, it, it is the same thrust, which is um, belief in uh, helping, uh, giving something back, that those sorts of concepts, I think. And Bob? Well, I think that's covered most of it. Mm -hmm. Making sure your organisation does good with all its resources, whether that be people or money, or which is my bit, or any other resources you can apply within your business model. Um, I mean, CSR is a very wide band. It goes from the, the environment to um, the lawyers that we deal with, obviously pro bono is a big part of that. But if you were a construction company, you'd try and do good things in parts of the world that need them. Um, and basically, as somebody's already said, making a positive impact with your resources is what it's all about. Absolutely. Um, so we'll start uh, with you, Bob, talking about the recent events. So COVID has had a really big impact on charities. We've seen that being reported across the board. Uh, what has been the impact on the sector and, and on the legal support trust in, ge in general? Well, I mean, obviously, I can only talk about the legal advice sector because that's the bit I dabble in. Although I see the reports of nine billion quid gone missing in um, in overall funding to charities, and that's fairly obvious. There's a lot of event fundraising every year, starting with the London Marathon onwards, and most of that's been cancelled. Um, 
with with the legal advice agencies, there's been like a threefold hit. They've had to restructure their their whole business to to do online advice, and that cost them money that they haven't got any money. So that's been quite a, quite a problem. And then their income from events has gone down as ever, but also their income from legal aid because you can't you can't see the clients and you can't get the forms filled in and the government, however lovely they sound, they're not changing their bureaucracy. So that's cost them money. And then while all that loss of money is happening, the demand for legal help has gone up immensely. Like when I say immensely, citizen advice East End are seen getting 450 calls a day now instead of a hundred and um, working families, the employment advice people, they've seen a sixfold increase in people needing help. And it's all obvious. Uh, Patrick at South West London said we're the seeing people that they would never have seen before, people that would never have needed help with benefits, housing, employment, but they've suddenly been dumped out into that world. Um, and so, roughly speaking, as a result of covid the demand for help has gone up and the resources to provide it have gone down um it's not looking good obviously okay. we hoped it would um be over soonish but that's not looking that way so i guess yeah. it's about us looking at how we can we can find different ways to support um i know us personally we we normally hold events and charity fundraisers and things like get involved in things like the legal work that are not taking place and it's difficult to find alternative ways to to do that um and something well, that we, well, we need to look at we did the walk of sorts as a virtual event and that's raised half what we normally do so we i mean you can't do expertise rocks can you because we no. can't walk all gather in a little club yeah uh, exactly and online for that may not be quite the same really it's a bit like what youtube <laughs> yeah, yeah we've looked at all the options of hosting it online and socially distanced and we so far we've not found a way that works but we're still trying we're still trying to get it off the ground for, for yeah. next year but we were really pleased with our two virtual events because we thought it'd be a disaster year and it has been a horrible year i mean we normally raise a million quid a year so we're just about at half a million now because of the two virtual events we've done. Keating win the first one, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so we've done virtual events, but we're going to have to be sending out appeals and we've never had to do that. Yeah. We've always got individual lawyers who want to do it. They come out, have fun, raise money, and that's great. Like all good CSR work and pro bono work, everybody wins. Just sending an appeal out and saying it's desperate send money that's <laughs> that's not the same thing but hopefully we'll get the response no, of course not and and talking of expertise rocks which is the little sister version of law rocks which is now a massive international success sarah you've been involved for a while and you, you know you give up your time for rehearsals and events what is it that you get out of being in, involved in it um I think um, it's a very entertaining way to raise huge amounts of money for extremely good causes. Um, so there's the feel good factor. Um, and, you know, you can't mention Law Rocks without mentioning Nick Child, who has given up huge, huge amounts of time to put this thing together. It just wouldn't have happened without him. Um, for those who don't know what Law Rocks is, it's effectively sad lawyers who can just about play twinkle twinkle on on a, an instrument get together and try to recreate rock classics um to a, a laughing uh, audience created by their colleagues and friends uh, so it's it's great fun it's it's really quite nerve-wracking um but it, it, it there are some spin-off benefits as well which i think are are really important for anyone who is interested in getting in, involved in something like this um, firstly, it allows you to see your colleagues in a completely different way. I, I now have seen the strengths and, and sometimes the weaknesses of some of my colleagues who I would never have been able to interact with in, in a non-legal uh, way, um, which is, is, is entirely lovely. Um, and also, I think it, it gives you a small peek into the world of what it might have been like to be a rock star, <laughs> which I think is absolutely fabulous. You know, you get to see the backstage carrying your kit around, all of that sort of stuff. So 
um, it, it stretches your brain in a slightly different way, which I think is really important for anyone in the workplace, particularly this year. Um, music is so important for me this year. I, I don't know about how other people uh, uh, manage to cope, but uh, that's one for me. Um, but yeah, underlying it all, the, 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 the huge amounts of money that we managed to raise in a, a painless and fun way, it is just, it's just the heart of it all. Absolutely. And they are brilliant events if anyone hasn't been to one before when when they do start up again to make sure you get along to them. Um, Bob, similarly for the legal walk, it always amazes me when you do the walk, how many people are there giving up their time. But is there a challenge that people know about the legal walk or they know about Law Rocks, but they know little about the charities that they're raising money for? And how do we get around that? Uh, well, they don't know much about London Legal Support Trust. Um, it's an interesting question and, and someday we'll have to do something about that. But we're really just a vehicle for firms to donate to the law centres and citizens' advice that we raise money for. And they and everybody knows about citizens' advice and law centres. Um, they just don't know about we who are the middlemen. Um, but but once you asked me that question on your email the other day, I thought, oh, we better do something about that. <laughs> about that. I've never cared, and that's the truth of it. I've never cared about publicising LLST because we are just a clothes horse. We just take the money in and give it out. That's all we do. We organize the events, take the money and give it out. So we're not the thing. The thing is the London Legal Walk or Walk the Thames, which you probably heard less about, or those other events. And then the advice agencies that deliver the advice on the front line. Um, and I think people do know about the advice agencies. They don't need to know about us. They don't need to know the mechanism by which their money goes to advice agencies and we lurk on top of the advice agencies making sure they spend the money properly and they don't waste it and we do an awful lot of work on that as well but yeah I, it's true people don't know much about LST and I think I might have to hire a marketing person to, uh, <laughs> to, to bring that out a little bit there's a, there's a few of them around looking for a job actually so. <laughs> Uh, we're going to move on and take a look at some of the environmental aspects now, environmental aspects, sorry, with, with Will. Will, what, what can companies do to reduce their environmental footprint? Yeah, um, it's a broad question. I guess <laughs> it depends on what sort of company you are and what um, industry you're in, uh, because there are many different driving forces behind the decisions that you make. If you are a uh, laundry firm, for example, then you're very tied down to the three aspects of um, it's within your profits margins, which is the water, energy and staff. And so you'd be looking at reducing your water as much as you possibly can and then reducing your energy. So monitoring that on a hourly almost minute by minute basis to understand exactly what it is that you're using and when you're using it and it can make such an impact on the type of um, say laundry um, machines that you've got so if you're in an office um, have a real close look at your building management system and try to understand exactly how your um, heating ventilation air conditioning units work what are, are there times on what what is it that you're doing um, how are you managing it? I, we um, run a podcast and um, yesterday we had a energy um, expert on talking about the biggest wins. And for her, if you're in a corporate environment, the what you should be having is the faci facilities and people in control of the building, understanding the rather complicated um, systems that are probably in place and there is a lot of software that's there to help you and I think what we see it and um, certainly it was highlighted was that people don't understand how to manage their buildings properly so really get it to grips with that managing um, and ensure that you are not being wasteful I know it sounds absolutely ridiculous but paying a consultancy to tell you to turn a light bulb off is a pretty ridiculous place to be Absolutely. And we'll, um, we'll make sure we share the details of the podcast and things with, with anyone who's interested with um, all the attendees after the event. Um, I mean, a lot of the time, these things, you know, 
whatever it is with CSR, it comes down to economic factors and companies want to know, you know, can I save money from it? Can it make me more profitable? Is that, you know, is that the case? Can you make money from being more sustainable? I would say, yes, you can. I mean, Unilever are a large company that are proving that 50% of their organizations are now purpose driven and sustainable of, of which all 50% are growing year on year much more so than I think they're growing by more than 50% than the other 50%, a lot of 50% in there. Um, and the, so therefore I think having sustainability, corporate responsibility in your um, remit and as a part of your business will attract higher caliber of colleagues to work for you. Clients are lo looking for it more and more. And yes, you can save money. I would say on average, if you're 50, if you're in an office environment and 50 people plus, then you could be looking at in the region of 10 to 30 percent um, emission savings in the first year, if not 10 to 15, 20 percent year on year after that, by looking at the different aspects of travel. I mean, COVID has played a massive curveball into the environmental arena I think we're all realizing and the more and more companies I talk to are starting to go maybe we don't need to travel to so many meetings this is interesting I don't need to go to New York for that hour-long meeting anymore because people are more comfortable with me talking over zoom or teams or whatever it is so yeah you can absolutely save money but I would not say that the driving force isn't necessarily about saving money either it's about um, ensuring that you're working for a sustainable company Okay. And beyond sustainability, is your company involved in any other CSR activities? Yeah, um, we're a B Corp, um, purpose driven business. We are every every um, month, every full time employee works for a charity of their choice. So we do 12 days a year per person. Um, we are a small organisation. There's only 12 of us. Um, but we are growing um, year on year. And then on top of that, we, a lot, we have a lot of digital services. So we have Compare Your Footprint, which is a carbon reporting software tool, which helps organisations report much more easily and automatically for the most part. And on scope one, two and three emissions, and we reduce that for different um, areas of the world. So we um, help in Ghana, we help in um, a lot of third world countries that are trying to be more sustainable but can't afford it. And uh, we've got our Green Element Academy, which is our training um, centre that helps organisations become more green. Again, that can be heavily discounted in different countries. We're, it, it's all about trying to get as many organisations to be as green as possible in line with that 1.5 degree increase um, by 2030. Thanks, Phil. And Sarah, I'm going to come back to you now with a question. Are there any downsides to getting involved? I mean, you know, particularly, I just think Chambers not so long ago were quite old fashioned and some of the costumes you guys have on stage, particularly some members of your band and things can be quite outrageous. Is there a risk of looking unprofessional or, or do you even care? <laughs> uh, uh, well, my outfits are always very tasteful. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Yes, I, I see what you mean. There might be a, a perceived inconsistency between the persona that a barrister is supposed to give uh, and um, performing on stage. I, I think, to be honest, though, that um, increasingly barristers are now uh, recognised as they truly are, which is a diverse and wide ranging set of individuals who are connected together by making you know, legal submissions to the courts. So um, I, I don't think that's uh, it. Too, too much risk. I think. I think the main drawback um, that you might find with um, getting involved in charitable, ethical, uh, societal-based um, uh, uh, activities is if you engage in it without sincerity. Um, I think there's a real uh, risk there. If you are going to do this, do it with your heart, um, because I think it's supposed to be uh, from there that that these uh, matters happen. And I think if you um, are, are primary, I mean, yes, there are spin-off benefits, you know, if you are wanting to use it in your recruitment or to show that you are um, a better organisation, whatever the underlying drive is, don't let that be your primary driver. I, I think it is damaging not only to the organisations that you're trying to support, but also it's just um, 
I, I just think it, it 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 falls dead a little. It it it's, it tastes bad in the mouth. So I I, I would say if, uh, it's perhaps perhaps less of a, a risk with an organisation such as my own where uh, you have sixty individuals who uh, get involved because they're passionate about it. But if you are an organisation with a, a central um, a department who leads this sort of thing, you know, um, forcing people to get involved can often be a, 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 a it can backfire. I, I suspect. So I think. I think people have to be passionate first and then the, the benefits will follow. Um, uh, uh, and, and other other parts of the CSR, I think if you've said that you're going to do something, uh, do follow through and do it. Um, so uh, on an ethical perspective, I happen to also be our ethical person uh, and uh, I've committed us to various uh, attempts to improve our buying power um, and we're not there yet uh, and so I, I don't want to promise publicly that that's what we're doing but you know things like palm oil in in our products or you know buying green energy and, and all those sorts of things we're getting there but we're not going to go public on that because I don't think we're necessarily uh, that far along the line um, and finally I think the only other thing I can really say about CSR type activities is um, often when you start looking at what the things that you can do you realize are we doing enough um it's, it's a huge huge area and and you start realizing just how privileged you might be and how much more you could be doing and i think there's a sort of a sense of you could become overwhelmed and and and, and freeze and not, and not do anything so i think keep small manageable chunks and keep adding to that but it has to be personally driven you can't force people to do this sort of thing I think that last point is definitely true. You do often feel you do one little thing and then you think, oh my God, there's so much more I should be doing or could be doing and, and it almost like you're drowning. Well, what are the biggest hurdles you find to people getting involved or, or you know, making organisational changes? I think it's worried that they're not going to do enough. I think what Sarah's just said is, is interesting and so true. And I think it's, um, but people don't know where to start. And it's not, it's not rocket science. It really isn't. It's literally look at what you're doing and look at how you're doing it and try and reduce that impact. And for the most part, your impact will be energy and travel. So have a look at that. How are you working as a business? I mean, we work a lot with advertising agencies and we've just pulled out a report for the Advertising Association on carbon emissions. And obviously the biggest thing is travel. And um, so therefore the industry are going, should we be traveling to pitches? Should we be pitching for work in New York as a London firm? But there's no reason why they shouldn't be working for that New York firm. And um, with technology the way it is, I think we don't need to be traveling as much. And I think that's where the COVID has actually massively almost helped the environmental um, world. We've now realized we don't need to travel. There are so many more people, bosses, businesses going, actually, People I work with are pretty cool. They actually get on with work. I don't need to see them working. They actually do work. And I think that is, it's that mind shift and that change mm -hmm. that really helped. Absolutely. And um, we're going to take some questions if there's any from the audience in a moment. So if you do have any questions, do put them in the chat or the Q&A. And just, just the final question coming to you, Bob, you know, just overall, what are the benefits? I mean, we've talked about a lot of them, but but what are the benefits charities do gain from supporting charity, uh, companies gain, sorry, from supporting charities and getting involved in these things? Well, the really big law firms gain a lot of benefits and they know that, which is why they produce those great big CSR reports at the end of every year. For a start, their customers like it. They like to see the law, law firm they're using doing good um socially minded young lawyers trainees coming in are likely to come to them more like they're more likely to come to them lawyers are more likely to stay with them they gain that sort that sort of advantage um the altruism's nice but i have to say i was there at the beginning of pro bono and it was a hard old slog to persuade nasty mcdermott in corporate finance head of corporate finance that it was worth putting resources into pro bono was what I was doing, but CSR has grown more really. Um, but they came there in the end because those partners that had vision persuaded them that it had a 
corporate benefit. And that thing about clients has become much more important. There's a lot of big firms now who won't hire a big solicitor's firm if they haven't got a decent CSR profile. <clears throat> and of course, that's something almost any big firm can do is make sure their suppliers are, uh, have got a reasonable profile. I mean, when we get T-shirts for the London Legal Walk, I mean, we're little, nobody cares about us. There's no way we would get T-shirts made by slaves out of GM crops. It's not going to happen, is it? Because <laughs> you see what happened to the Labour Party when they were that stupid. And right across the board, there's lots of benefits. And it's partly to do with self-respect for everybody within the firm. Those that want to do it can do it. I don't believe in conscription or either. I mean, a tax lawyer that belongs in a dungeon should not be out on a wet Wednesday advising people <laughs> in Battersea because they wouldn't know what to do. Um, but, but joining in where you can join in and where you want to join in, it really makes a huge difference. And I like it that now when I go to those big firms, there's always recycling bins on every floor. There's always places to put everything that can be recycled. There's always something going on that's to do with supporting charity. And that's not just because of the benefits, but it has a benefit. They don't do it just because it looks good. The, the, the corporate bit, the corporate head do, um, but the people don't. The people do it because that's what they want to do. And so I saw, I mean, it is big. It's different for those huge firms. Um, if you're a small organisation, there's less you can do. And it has to be driven by individuals. The big firms, they can tell somebody, you're going to help the local scout hut fight the builders that messed up their roof. I saw that done. But the lawyers don't mind that. It's, let's do something nice. The questions come in. I've seen Will's just put a little bit in the text, but perhaps I'll, I'll throw it over to you and then and then maybe come to Sarah after as well. An attendee would like to know any tips and guidance that speakers can provide on getting started with a CSR action plan. Perhaps a smaller firm that would like to set up but doesn't know where to even begin. Will, do you want to take this one? Yeah. Um, I, I think it is really hard for smaller businesses and um, I, I'm very very aware of how hard it is um, for small businesses to understand what to do and how to do it um, but there are so many free resources out there by consultants like us we have loads of ebooks and services that cater to those small businesses but equally b corp websites um, and then it if you go to those consultancies that deal with corporate responsibility they have blog articles they have tips on what to do and how to do it because they're all trying to get you to buy off them anyway so therefore actually there are so many free resources and we fall into that category which is why i know they exist but it's brilliant for everyone else because it is a great place to go to and actually i honestly don't think you should be spending that much money on consultants to get the program going just just get people involved it's that passion it's what sarah said earlier about you can't do this without passion and if you've got that passion you'll get the everything will be done in just naturally and sarah as someone who sort of started this at your firm what baby steps can people take what would you advise um i think don't try and achieve everything at once identify what's the priority for you it might be uh, charitable pursuits, it might be ethical standards in your firm, it might be societal impacts like giving back to underprivileged people in recruitment. Pick, pick one thing, start there and see how you get on. I wouldn't try and cover it all because as you say you'll, you'll just get overwhelmed and, and, and feel you know, a bit depressed because you haven't achieved anything. Um, and uh, the, the real boon is whenever you start seeing a difference and you think ah oh, it really does work. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's all we've got time for today. Um, thank you all for joining us. It's been it's been really fascinating. We've we've covered so much, but there's also so much in in terms of CSR that we haven't even touched on today. But um, uh, as as usual, we will have the video up on our website, and we'll send out a write up and also a link to some of the resources that that the um, the panelists have been mentioning about. And we'll send you details of our next event. Too, which will be in in two weeks time so thank you once again for joining us and uh, hope to see you all again soon
Thank you.